Well, good morning, church. Good morning, John. And good morning to all of you who are joining us online. It's good to see you on this beautiful Lord's Day and the first Sunday of October, if you can believe that. You go into stores now and they're already selling not only Halloween, they're selling Thanksgiving and Christmas all at once. Let's just go and throw Valentine's in there. Let's just go ahead and do it all at once. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Now my task today is really a simple task. My task isn't to come and to instruct. My task today is to really come and to remind. As you heard a few moments ago from Steve, uh, I was asked back in the summer if I would take the first couple Sundays of October and have a stewardship emphasis. And, you know, stewardship, that's simply saying that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. And if everything belongs to God, then what we are are simply stewards of whatever we have, because it all belongs to God. So I was asked if I would do, the, do an emphasis on stewardship. I know when I say the word stewardship, what you hear is money. And I know when I, I, you hear money, that's kind of like me telling you to go sit on an anthill. It's just that uncomfortable and it's just that, do we have to talk about that at church? I mean, really? Now here we are in an interim time and the interim time is always a time when things sort of settle financially. They, it sort of takes a drop and we're getting ready for a new year and we're still in the interim time and it could wind up dropping even a little bit more. It's a good time right now to talk about this because this is an important part of our life. And when we talk about it, I know it's uncomfortable like I said, sitting on an anthill. And I've often been told over the years that whatever churches I've been at, tell you what, John, you just preach the gospel and you leave the finances to us. Now, you know what a pastor hears when they hear that? That means I'm shooting down the right hole right where they are. This is something they're uncomfortable with. This has got to be something that we talk about. And so they say, just preach the gospel. Well, to be honest with you, I don't know how you preach the gospel and not talk about money. Uh, that would be trying to do something that Jesus couldn't even pull off. Do you know that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about repentance? Do you know that he talked about money ten times, not two times, not three times, not four times? He talked about money ten times more often than he even talked about the church. So you've got to ask the question, why is this so important? And Jesus will simply tell you why it's important. Money is a powerful force in our lives. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not moral. It's not immoral. Money is just that. It's money. It's how we relate to it that makes it good or makes it bad or makes it moral or makes it immoral. It's about how we relate to it. Not that money is anything other than just what it is. So the question for us is how do we relate to these powerful forces in our life? It's like relating to the law of gravity. It's not good, it's not bad. Relate to it well and it holds the very planets in its grip as they spin and it keeps them from just spinning off into space as it keeps us from spinning off into space. Relate to it well, it's a good thing. Relate to it poorly, it will crush you. Same thing with electricity, another powerful force. Relate to it well, it will cook your meals. Relate to it well, it will keep you warm. It will light up your life. But if you relate to it poorly, it will burn you to a crisp. How do we relate to this powerful force in our lives call money? How do we relate to it properly 
And how do we relate to it wisely? Well, that brings us to the story today. Do you know that when Jesus told 26 of the parables, 20 of them related to money? And we looked at one today that related to money. And as Aaron read it just a little while ago, you heard how disruptive money was in the life of this particular family. It's the disruption that tore the family absolutely apart. So how do we relate to it? Because this is more than just about money. I know that's what we hear, but it's more than that. This gets down to the very core and nature of God. This gets down to the very core and nature of you and me when we talk about this. Do you remember when you went into biology class when you were in high school? I remember well. I remember being flabbergasted at how this world operates. How God designed for this world to function. What I learned in biology class was plants, they give out oxygen which I need to survive and you need, I bring that oxygen into me and then I return back into the world and when I exhale, carbon dioxide, which is exactly what the plants need in order to live and thrive. And there is this harmonious balance that God built into the universe and built into this world of receiving and then giving, and then giving, and receiving. And that is the harmonious nature that God designed this world to operate by. And it comes out of the very generous heart of who God is. And if we defy that, we're going to see the consequences of that. Now, this harmonious balance... Nature gets that. The lower life forms, they get that right away. Animals get that. They receive and they give. They do it instinctively. They don't have to think about it. But God didn't design you and me that way. We are not designed to do this instinctively. When we come into the world, we're takers. And if we don't get what we want, we scream about it. And, and if we don't scream loud enough, we'll scream even louder to make you so miserable, you will give us what we want. That is how we enter this world. We enter it as takers. And our hope is that somewhere along the line, we will mature and we will grow, and we will choose. We have to make a choice. We will choose to not just be takers. We will decide to be givers. Can you imagine living in a house full of people who only want to take and scream Can you imagine how miserable that life would be? The whole balance of your life would be destroyed and absolutely broken. Now, welcome to the story of the prodigals, of the Good Samaritan, I'd say Good Samaritan, of the prodigal son. Welcome to the story of the prodigal son. Here's a boy who grew up as a taker and never learned how to give. He grew up demanding whatever he could from whomever he wanted. It was all about his happiness. It was all about his wants. It was all about his dreams. It was all about him. It got so bad that he even went to his father and said, I want my inheritance and I want it now. Do you know what that means? He was telling his father, this is how bad takers can get. He was telling his father, I wished you were dead. 
If you were dead, it let, I'd get 50%. But since you're not dead and we have to divide it up, I'm only going to get a third, and I'll take my third right now. Thank you. How would you feel if that happened in your home? Wouldn't you be heartbroken? That's exactly how this father is feeling. All this father has ever been to this boy is generous. The father is absolutely heartbroken. How do you respond to a child who acts like that? My nature would be, fat chance you're going to get any of this. I don't know what your reaction would be. I'll be honest with you. That would be my reaction. See how much of this you're going to get. But I'm glad the father in this story is a lot smarter than me. He knows the way you deal with this kind of taking. You don't, you don't deal with it by taking. You deal with it by being generous. He knows for this boy, words have lost their power. He is unteachable right now. The only way this boy's going to learn, you know, there's two ways we learn. We learn either by being taught from someone else, or we learn by enrolling in the only institution that sometimes will teach us, and that educational institution is called, called the School of Hard Knocks. He just enrolled in the School of Hard Knocks. And what does the father do? is he gives, gives him his share. He's generous. And what does the boy do? He goes to the far country. Do you know what the far country is? It's only a change of address. That's all it is. He's not going to live any differently in the far country than he did at home. I mean, if you have the flu and you walk into the other room, does that get rid of the flu? All you do is carry that flu with you into the other room. You just carry the same set of germs with you wherever you go. That's what this boy does. He just goes and he's just carrying the very way he was living at home now into the far country. And he was living for himself. And a famine came to that far country. And what happens? No surprise. Anybody who lives like that, sooner or later, life is going to come breaking down. And his life comes breaking down all around him. Try to find the way God designed this world to work. Define the very nature of God and watch your world collapse. It got so bad, Jesus said, no one was willing to help this one. He just landed in poverty. Poverty of the heart, poverty of the spirit, and in his case, literal poverty, eating with the pigs. I'm intrigued by this defying of God's order of the world and what happens to us when we defy that. Let me give you a test right now. I'm going to let you test this about defying the way God designed this world. Now, I'm going to give you a test, but I'm going to ask you not to take it. Because if you take it, we're going to have EMTs coming from all over Richmond to come pick you up and carry you to the hospital. But imagine taking it in your head. Here's the test. I would like for everybody in their mind right now, don't do it literally, with all of your energy, I want you to take. I want you to take every bit of air you can get in this room and you just take it into yourself. Be greedy with it. Just breathe it all in. Take it all in. This is yours. And now I want you to hold it. Don't you dare give a little bit back. That's not our nature. 
We're just going to take. I want you to take this air and I want you to hold it and hold it. What's going to happen to you? In a few minutes, you're going to die. Defy the nature of God and the way he designed this universe. Life comes collapsing down around you. And that's what happened to this young man. He took, he took, and he didn't know how to give. And his life collapsed. Now, thank goodness, that's not the end of the story. Thank goodness that he was at his lowest point. He remembered something. He remembered home. He remembered his father. He remembered the farm. He remembered the generosity of his father and the give and take of a farm life. And he remembered that there was so much food, there was food to spare. Even the servants of his father had more than enough to eat. And then scripture says those incredible words. He came to himself. Do you know in Greek what that means? In Greek what that literally means is he came out of a coma. It was as if he had been in a coma. And he came out of a coma. And it changed everything. I want you to see how it changed him. This is powerful. You want to see the power of this? God's nature in him and God's nature in us. Look at what it did to this young boy. This young boy now understands. He's been taking and taking and he says, I no longer deserve to be your son. Can I come home? And a son, he'd been taking But can I come home as a servant? And what does a servant do but give and give and give? And the father sees the son coming home and he runs out to him and he embraces him and he looks into his son's face. You know what he sees? This boy has changed. I see it in his face. This boy's heart is different. I see it in his face. There's a new spirit inside my son. He was lost. And look at him now. He's found. Here's a question today. What spirit's in you? What heart is in you? Are you enough like God to be generous? When God looks into your face, what does he see? I know life circumstances have piled all kind of stuff on top of us. And I know those circumstances have killed our inclination to be like God and to be as generous as we would really like to be in our hearts. I get that. I get that circumstances absolutely disrupt our nature. But folk, this, is, this goes deeper than just us. This goes to our children. What do they see in us? Do they see us just receiving or do they see us giving in a way that they can tell something matters to us? That something other than ourselves is important to us. Uh, We raise our children well, teaching them how to receive. Every birthday, we make sure they're loaded with gifts. Every Christmas, we make sure there's plenty of stuff underneath the tree for them. Every other special occasion in their life, we make sure there's plenty for them to see and open and for them to know that they're loved. We work really hard at that, but do we work as hard at helping them learn how to be givers? Remember, that's not our instinct. 
that's something we have to learn. That's something we have to choose. Do we work hard at helping them get their toys together and them taking it to goodwill? Do we work hard at them doing something for someone who can't do for themselves just because they need to give something to someone else? One of my favorite stories is Deb and growing up, and one Christmas her dad got a brand new winter coat. And I love every time Deborah tells this story, I see how important that story is in her life. It shaped her. It modeled for her the kind of person she wanted to be. Her dad got this winter coat that he needed badly, brand new. They didn't get many brand new things as a family, but this was a beautiful winter coat. And her dad said, I, there's a gentleman in the church who's not feeling well, who's by himself and lonely. I just want to go by and check on him. And he made sure Deborah went with him. And when he went into the house to check on him, not sure Deb could go in if he were sick. She left, he left Deb out in the car. But when he came out of the house, he didn't have his coat on. And Deb asked him, where's your coat, Dad? Oh, he was in the house freezing, and he got nothing for Christmas. I gave him my coat. Are we teaching our kids how to give? I was fortunate to grow up where I had well modeled for me generosity. It was modeled in my, my home. It was modeled in my grandparents. I remember I was mowing the grass and I saw on the side of the road that a dog had been hit. And I went over to check on the dog and it had died. It was a female dog and unfortunately five little puppies were scrambling trying to eat from their dead mother. I didn't know what to do so I ran in a house and I told my grandmother, I said, do you have a box? I mean, we need to rescue these five puppies. So I went and got the five puppies and I took them and I put them in the kitchen. And I went over to the cabinet and I pulled out my grandmother's palm olive dishwashing liquid. And it was an empty bottle, so I took it and I washed out the bottle and I put a mixture of milk. And I don't know why I did this. Why does anyone do some of the things you do? I mixed the milk with oatmeal. And so I mixed it in there and I pulled it and poured it in that palm olive bottle and I gave it to the puppies, which they lapped up. What I didn't know, when you put oatmeal with milk with little puppies, that upsets their tummies. And they made an awful mess, all five of them, all over my grandmother's kitchen floor. And my, my grandmother came walking in the kitchen. And she said, what in the world are you doing? I said, well, I just gave them something to eat. Well, what did you give them? I mixed some oatmeal in with the milk. And she said, you do know that's like giving them prunes. And then she just started laughing, and you, I wish you could hear my grandmother laugh. It was the laugh of all laughs. It'll be a laugh I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. And she sat on the floor, helped me clean up the mess. Granddad came in and said, what is going on in here? You guys sound like a couple of hens out here just laughing and giggling. He said, oh, these puppies, I know a family up the street that would love these puppies. Come with me, son. Let's take him up there. And as we walked out, my grandmother gave me a big hug. Johnny, is what she called me. Don't you ever stop feeding the puppies. I had modeled for me generosity. Folks, generosity is the nature of God. It's how he designed his world and his universe to function. The rain falls and it evaporates and it goes back up into the heavens only to fall again and rise again. And this week, past two weeks, we have seen the power of that. 
leaves are about ready to fall and they're going to fall to the ground and they're going to create a blanket around the trunk of the tree to keep it warm in the winter months. Those roots will stay warm enough to be able to survive the dead of winter. And then when spring comes, those leaves will rot into the ground and they will give life to those roots that the tree might blossom for another season. It's the way God designed his world and he's put within you and me gifts deep inside of us that are ours to give. So what is God saying to you about the attitude of your heart? It's not about the size of your checks. It's about the attitude of your heart. Giving is a heart issue. For God so loved the world, he what? He gave. And he gave us his only son that we might have life. We're talking about generosity. We're talking about you. God has put something inside of you to give. My question today, has it been ambushed? Life does that to us. Has it just become encrusted? Has it become dormant? Are we just out of practice? God is asking you to rekindle that spirit, to stir up that heart again of yours. This morning is a character checkup. Not asking what's in your wallet. I'm asking it for you to check what's in your heart. How can you find the joy again of being a cheerful giver? God loves a cheerful giver. Folks, it's time to be generous again. Maybe we need to do what that young man did. Maybe we need to come to ourselves. Maybe we've been in a coma. It's time to come out. Our needs is that we receive. Our love is that we give. Let's rekindle that spirit. Let's pray. Father, I have to be honest and simply say it's so easy to get in a mindset of take, 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 because life is so full of insecurities and we never have enough. And the more we have, the more threatened we are that we might lose it. So it doesn't even help to ask for more because it just makes us worse. Lord, we've been in a coma. Our children need us to see, to see us believe in something again and believe in it sacrificially. This is a matter of the heart. May we give you our hearts today. For I pray this in Christ's name who gave us his life. Amen.